Omeka is a popular and powerful program used by libraries, archives, museums, and research centers to share rich multimedia content with the public. UCSC's own Grateful Dead Archive Online, as well as many other scholarly projects, use the program to create visually rich explorations of historical, literary, artistic, and other materials. These projects are many years in the making and involve teams of scholars, librarians, technologists, students, and others to put together. But Omeka can also be used in a much less formal way in the classroom. I know many of you in the audience are advanced users of Omeka, and what I'm covering today will probably be obvious to you. But for instructors in attendance today who are not using Omeka, and thinking about how you may incorporate the program into your classroom, today I'll describe some of the ways I've been using Omeka to teach some basic skills in my class, Digital History. I'll hopefully show you how the most basic version of the program, with low startup costs um, in terms of time and technology, can provide a platform for student engagement with traditional and new forms of scholarship. So my goals with Omeka are not to create a well-curated, well-edited, and visually harmonious website for the public on a specific research topic, but instead to introduce students to the messy work of making history in the digital world. The 10-week, one-quarter class exclusively run for junior and senior history majors asks students to explore how new digital practices are changing the way historical information is gathered, is interpreted, and disseminated. This includes both in the academy, in terms of historical research, as well as more public forms of history, like museums and crowdsourced platforms like Wikipedia. While a substantial component of the course is the critical analysis of existing forms of digital scholarship in the field, a large part of the class focuses on the students experimenting hands-on with new technologies. I ask students to create their own digital history projects, forcing them to grapple with the potentials and problems that these new technologies bring. While I know that platforms are in constant change, and students also need to understand the background, data sets, or theoretical frameworks behind many technologies and platforms, I'm a strong advocate of learning about technologies through actually using them. I believe students can best understand the possibilities of a new technology by building things with the technology and running directly into its limitations. Making their own projects in platforms like Ameca gives students the opportunity to look under the hood of digital projects and get a firsthand view at their complexity. Along with this experience, of course, they also get practice presenting their work live, on the fly, in class to their peers, and collaborating with other students in the class. So in Emeka, I have four major skills that I hope students learn over the quarter. The first is the importance of documenting one's sources and the proper use of metadata. Second, how to incorporate non-textual sources into scholarly argumentation effectively. Third, how to structure an argument in this new digital format. And fourth, that digital work is more successful when it's collaborative and allows team members to contribute their own knowledge and strengths to the collective. As you'll see, the topics covered in this class are incredibly diverse and represent the individual interests of my students. I encourage them to create projects based on their major concentration so that they're bringing their own knowledge from past coursework to bear on their assignments. And while I can imagine how having a class work collaboratively together on a single topic would offer one set of possibilities, here I'm allowing students to, play, to place the emphasis not on learning new historical content, but on how we can access, manipulate, analyze, and visualize that content in new ways. So I'd like to show you some screenshots from my student projects um, from the first two times that I've taught this class, both this year and last year. Um, so in my first Emeka assignment, to get students familiar with the basics of data collection and documentation, I asked each individual student to make an Emeka site focusing on a narrow historical topic. Each site needed to have a series of um, what Emeka calls items. 
um, which in the field of history would function as primary or secondary sources. The items needed to be tagged and placed into collections. And the goal here was to get students thinking about how to gather multimedia primary sources and how to document them in a standardized way. Um, and so one of my students was writing a paper in another class on um, Marie Laveau, and you can see a slide here from her individual project. Now, as a historian, I spend a great deal of time in all of my classes haranguing my students about documentation and citation of sources, and I assure you to their great chagrin. Um, what Emeka does by standardizing a place for metadata for each item, for each primary or secondary source entered by students, is to show them clearly how the type of documentation they do in a history research paper can be translated to the online format. And from my perspective, this is especially useful for students because at the end of the quarter, um, when I asked them to put together a list of what made for good digital history projects, they said that the best projects gave full information on the source of their content. By creating their own metadata, they clearly saw what many projects online are missing and why such omissions make those projects problematic. Um, what I also find very useful about the way that Ameka's items work is that textual materials like this 1881 New York Times article about Marie Laveau's death are acknowledged to be objects, similar to her portrait, which was, in the, um, which was the last item I showed. So instead of excerpting and integrating the 1881 text within the student's own writing, here the article is preserved in a format more close to the original, showing the original context, format, and even the text font of the article chronicling her death. Texts are shown to be a product of their time and an artifact with size, color, and style, not simply ideas that float from the past through today. They are grounded in the materiality of their original form. For this class, initially I asked students to do an individual project using a Mecca, but later in the quarter, students broke off into groups of three to five and collaborated on a joint project different from their initial individual projects. These were their final class projects and counted for a large percentage of their grade. Students were asked to go a step further in this project, creating exhibits that took the reader through a clear historical argument. They needed to ask a research question, identify and upload primary sources as items, and then curate their exhibit to use those items to support their conclusions. Um, one of my groups chose to explore the rise of Christianity by looking at its expression in three important early centers, and this is a screenshot from their project. Now, history is traditionally a heavily, uh, heavily text-based discipline. As an archeologist, I try to get my students to engage critically with other types of sources. And for this project, I encouraged the students to think about how a wider group of cultural materials could be used to compare and contrast development about these past places. So the students came up with some creative ideas. Um, we'd done 3D modeling in the class, and students used those skills to model historical reconstructions of early Christian churches at the three sites, placing them on satellite imagery in their original location. Now, while the version of Emeka that we were using, um, which was a, a free sort of low-level version, doesn't allow for the upload of SketchUp or Google Earth files, students included their work as items using screenshots or video. The reconstructions forced them to think about issues like interior space and size of the early churches, as well as how they'd changed so dramatically in later times. The students incorporated daily life objects as primary sources like this flask with early Christian imagery. In their exhibit on martyrdom in the early church, they could then include discussions of not only the related religious texts, but also how messages about such practices were expressed and disseminated in the ancient world in material culture format, especially important since these would have been highly illiterate societies. I especially appreciate how the visual aspect of a Mecca really pushes objects to the front giving them equal weight as traditional texts. Students began to see how such objects were not just illustrations to their argument, but key pieces of evidence that needed to be analyzed and deconstructed in the same way as texts. 
Another group chose a project much closer to home. Um, they wanted to explore the Miss California pageant, invented by a Santa Cruz businessman in 1924. I bet you didn't know that. Um, in covering the topic, they had to contextualize it within first wave feminism and the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. They also looked at the legacy of the pageant, second wave feminism, and the anti-pageant demonstrations in Santa Cruz in the late 1970s and early 1980s. The structure of a Mecca with exhibits that are broken down into a series of themes or pages and subpages, um, which here appear on the right of the screen, forced the team to think carefully about the organization of their argument and sources. The digital structure acts as a scaffolding or outline for the project, forcing students at each point to articulate their main points and decide how each piece of evidence fits into the whole. I also liked that the option for the reader to click on any link in the digital space challenged the teams to reevaluate every paragraph. What if your reader doesn't follow your linear structure? The students had to learn that each page needed to make sense, to stand alone, to provide content that could be understood no matter what order in which it was approached. Um, and I'd love to be able to make my students do this for their writing in traditional research papers. <laughs> Importantly, they also began to grapple with how to support an argument visually. In one section discussing anti-pageant demonstrations, students combined a series of images and video showing women and men protesting and being arrested for disrupting the Miss California event. Here the page graphically represents or graphically presents the different and highly visual techniques that activists used in their protest of the objectification of women art installations, elaborate costuming, and the pouring of blood on the street. So obviously a digital platform like a Mecca that allows students to utilize this material in a visual way provides something new for their work. And I found that my students in general are very unsophisticated about the critical analysis of visual materials. And I think that this could be a really good forum for working further on those skills. Using a Mecca in the classroom as a place for collaborative work provides students a chance to work concretely on something with a visible and tangible output. As a person who's worked on a number of digital projects myself, I know that projects cannot be successful without the cooperation of people with a variety of skills. And students are often resistant to collaborative projects. Um, but I believe that they quickly understood the need for cooperation um, when dealing with putting together something with many components um, and that they wanted to be able to show others as the output of their work. And so I think they internalize this much more quickly than they do with other traditional projects. Now part of my students' final projects um, was to include a group authored written analysis of the project, outlining the responsibilities of each member of the group and an evaluation of what worked well as a group and what they learned about how to collaborate better um, next time. And it was clear from looking at the management parts of the sites that they had learned how to identify the strengths of each team member, um, with certain students focusing on things like mapping or uploading and metadata, and while other tasks they shared more equally. And so this is just um, the sort of internal management page which um, I could see as an um, instructor. In one of my classes, students specifically mentioned the organization it took within the group was key. Each member had to have the work they promised the other members of the group ready so that the next team member could upload it or use it to create a map or to create a visualization, etc. Now, all of these projects were created using the free, most basic version of Emeka, Emeka.net. Students signed up for their own accounts and shared them with me as an instructor or as an administrator. Um, so that I could access their work. Because these class projects are incomplete and not fully edited, they're kept private for the purposes of the class. Um, and we're really utilizing the most basic features of Emeka.net, really without any bells or whistles. But for those of you thinking about adopting Emeka for teaching students some basic skills and scholarship, I think that perhaps including too many options and fancy tools just proves distracting to the students. So as you've seen, my students' projects are relatively small, highly unedited, and not a huge amount of time was spent making them look great. But that's okay. 
Um, Omeka does not need to be used only for creating sophisticated publishable projects. I use it in my class to give students an experimental space to actively engage in some of the most elemental aspects of digital history. How do you document sources correctly? How do you structure an argument successfully in the given format? How can you include multimedia or non-textual materials as primary sources in an effective way? How can you express your argument and support it in a way that your reader can follow? And these are, it is important to point out, the same communication skills that I hope to teach my students in my traditional history classes. So Emeka offers me the chance to both reinforce the skills that my students have been gaining in the history major, while also offering them a chance to explore new aspects of digital history. And that's what I call a win-win. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for Elaine? Hi. Uh, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one interesting thing that I saw in the, the presentations is, on one hand, you said the sites were kept uh, private. So yes. only people that were using it in the classroom could see them. But in the first project, I saw that somebody had flipped on the social bookmarking plugin. Oh, yes. And, and so I'm wondering if there was sort of a design. That's a great point. Um, so in my class, we did talk a lot about um, crowdsourcing, um, involving the public in your work, um, public history, museums. And so we talked a lot about what would you want your project to look like, um, and how would you want the public to be able to comment on it or to contribute to it. Um, and so part of their project was to design the um, sort of the template for what the future publishable version would look like. And so um, my students were all very excited about the social, um, the networking element of, of the project. And so all of them really saw them as kind of ways for other so they, they added it in in a sort of hypothetical way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry if I missed this, but um, could you say where students went to get the sources, those primary sources, if they are incorporated into the Omeka project? Could you say a little more about that? Sure. So I encourage my students to do projects um, that are related to the state of California um, so that they could possibly be utilizing um, resources that are here in the UCSC library. And so the Miss California pageant, um, a number of those things were either from here or from one of the local museums that had um, information posted online. Um, some of my students do projects that um, their research is really sort of all over the place, like the one on early Christianity. Um, so they're really harnessing sources from um, websites, museums, um, all over the place. And so part of the reason that we keep the sites private is that um, a lot of the materials that they're using from things like museums are that they wouldn't be able to get uh, access to or wouldn't be able to get permission to use within a 10-week period of our course. Thank you. Do you have any advice for an instructor? We did one, uh, another, where we had a to um, teach the actual like you know focus of the class on the history the topics of that they were trying to research and then also then do teach them a lot of the issues that you were teaching with of how to explore that visually and make an argument in there create an exhibit where they're making an argument and really you know telling a story so do you have any um, advice on how to actually Teaching a historical topic, or a, you know, and then also actually teaching them how to create an Omeka exhibit, or it's challenging to try to do both things in one ten-week class. It is challenging. Um, the quarter system does make that uh, really difficult to do. Ten weeks is not a lot of time, um, so I, I think it's always a bit of a trade-off that whatever you're spending time doing, you're not spending time doing the other thing. So um, this class, because it's specifically about um, 
how we practice history was not really about learning content around ancient Egypt, for example. Um, so in this class, I wasn't sort of forced to try to do a huge amount of subject specialty area knowledge as well as, as digital knowledge. Um, so I think it was a little bit easier here. Um, the only thing that I can really think of is to try to be incorporating each element that you're teaching the students into sort of the correctly into the time period that you're working with or the area of the subject um, that you're working with to try to make those two things sort of move together. But it certainly is a challenge. Right. Yes. Um, so what uh, computing environment were the students working in? Did they have their own laptops? Were they using campus labs? Yes, yeah, so we were using campus labs. This, um, this history class was fully scheduled in the campus computing lab. That, that's where we spent the entire time. Um, so when we did the tutorials on how to use a Mecca, I taught them those myself in the campus lab. I provided links to um, the Mecca pages that describe how to do things so that they could go back and review uh, things that they'd forgotten how to do. Part of them working together collaboratively is that they can then um, remind each other of how to do things that they've each forgotten, um, which they work really well as peer tutors. Um, that's really one of the major advantages of this sort of group work. Um, and then I scheduled additional lab time for them to make sure that they could get together um, as groups in order to have access to the computer labs. And then they also just worked on them at home on their own laptops. That's one of the lovely things about Emeka.net is it's fully web-based, so they can access it from anywhere and on their own computers. You mentioned um, that in your classrooms you talk about uh, structuring arguments in digital formats. Um, can you expound upon that? Because that, that's very interesting to me, particularly in terms of the 3D work that you do, because if, if you're working text to text, you can apply the same kind of traditional methods, but when you're working in something that's visual and spatial and experiential, and then translating that into something that's, that's linear and verbal like how how do you how do you how does that work and how does that apply to a mecca right um that is still definitely a challenge <laughs> right um and i mean my own personal research is in 3d and um i haven't quite figured out the how i'm going to do that with my own work yet um and it might not be through a mecca um but i'm at least asking my students um here in terms of structuring arguments to think about the fact that um, everything, you know, that we're breaking down this linear structure and that people are accessing or your user is accessing this from multiple um, sort of points of view and, and in multiple orders. Um, and so part of that is to have them create a structure that, that is understandable but that also can be broken down. Um, and I'm not necessarily sure I was incredibly um, effective at doing that, but it was sort of the first time they were trying it out um, as well. Um, I mean, I think part of it is just allowing them to be flexible to see that um, it's not a five paragraph essay, that things don't necessarily flow together, that there, that even some aspects of your argument can disagree with each other. And part of the having these separate pages sort of forces them to reconcile um, those kinds of issues of history that we all deal with as researchers. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> Right, so any way you can incorporate um, multimedia materials into something that is understandable to people in the academy and that they can access without having fancy software and fancy downloads, things that they can learn how to do in a very 2D environment, and then you can bring in these other arguments into it and have it be part of 
um, a traditional, now a new traditional sc scholarly argument, I think is a win for anyone doing 3D, multimedia, oral histories, all of those kinds of things, because it brings that kind of material into a larger discussion group. Um, because, of course, otherwise it's, you're just talking to other people that are making 3D projects, and that's not any of our goal, um, to sort of be siloed into this group of very, very small digital people, right? We want to be having these conversations with the people in our subject specialty areas who are maybe not comfortable with anything more than being able to click through a website. Um, hi, Elaine. Great presentation. Hi, um, just a question. Are you finding uh, with your students in these kinds of classes any need for them to have a digital artifact as a result of this research that they would like to have uh, on their resumes or something that they might want to continue to develop over the course of their careers? Yeah, I, I do think that um, they would like to have those types of things to show potential employers, for example. Um, because of Mecca.net, they own the site. Um, I can't delete their site for them. So they have, they can take this with them. Um, the sites are, of course, not fully edited. They're not really maybe mature projects that they're ready to show a lot of people. But if they're trying to get a job somewhere and they can um, articulate the fact that they understand how metadata works, they can maybe show some excerpts from this site, show people that they've thought about how to put together things like coherent arguments in space. Um, I, I think that, that those types of things are going to be more and more useful and that they're going to be um, more interested in being able to take those things with them and, and to have a concrete thing to show sort of potential employers. Mm-hmm.